Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canelli, and welcome back to Before the Lights Podcast, the show that tells you how they made their mark. He's a songwriter, country singer, social media creator, a guitarist that is sponsored by Natural Light Beer, and the owner of Treehouse Records, a musician on the rise, and an Alabama native. Please welcome to the show, Jesse Cofty. Jesse, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Tommy. You are welcome. Listeners, Merry Christmas. This is our Christmas show. And as is tradition on this podcast for this time of year, when the show is over, and I call it the credits, but I do all the music at the end, stay tuned for the traditional Christmas music that we'll be playing. And I'll remind you about that at the end of the podcast as well. But right now, back to Jesse. What's your first memory of music? Shoot. First memory of music. I mean, I'd have to say growing up in Alabama um, with my dad, we used to ride around and he had this old beat up piece of crap kind of Chevy. <laughs> we used to ride around and my dad liked like Conway Tweedy and the old classic guys. Um, so we'd ride around re- releasing that and kind of funny enough, George Strait's one of my favorite artists. And I always thought it was Armadillo by morning when I was a little kid. <laughs> You thought it was Am- 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 Armadillo by morning? I thought it was, when I was a little kid, I was like six or so, and it was Armadillo by morning is what I thought. <laughs> your musical influence then comes from your father because he was a writer as well. When, yes, sir. When did you like really start to embrace music? When did it become like part of your life? Kind of started when I was really young. I used to have like, I used to write songs in notebooks um, they were terrible songs, but I used to write songs all the time and I'd write them in notebooks and stuff like that. Didn't really sing them for anybody every now and then I'd let like my family see them. And then that was kind of it for music. And then I went and in, it was either high school or college. I believe it was freshman year of college. I was playing college soccer. I got a scholarship and played soccer and just getting injured. And through all that, I picked up guitar a little bit and then just started diving back into music a lot more. So it was really probably freshman year of college that I really dove in a lot more. I want to talk about your hometown, Wetumpka, a small town of about 7,000 in Alabama. What's yeah. interesting about it is it's had some major movies filmed there, such as the Rosa Park story, Big Fish, and Son of the South. Talk about growing up in such a small town. I grew up in a small town myself. Curious what yours was like. Man, it is small. I remember when Big Fish was filmed, too. We, was, we snuck down to, I guess, like behind where you're not supposed to go for the stage <laughs> stuff, just so we could see who was it. It was either, was it Tim Burton or Steven Spielberg? It was one It was one of those big directors directed it, so we got to see him sitting up in his little chair. But it was that was a really cool thing for our town because it brought a lot of revenue into downtown and stuff. But it was, man, being a small town, you didn't really think it was a small town growing up. Everybody did the same things. You know, we grew up right next to about 500 acres of land that our neighbor had. And also we spent every day just playing in the woods and we thought that was typical. And so then when we started, you know, going off and seeing a little, a little bit of other stuff and we didn't realize that most people don't grow up that way. <laughs> like, I don't remember, like, honestly, we did not have a lock on our front door. We never locked our front door in my entire life. We'd go on vacation. We the doors unlocked. I never had a key to my house growing up for 20 years. You know, I know somebody else who doesn't have a key to their house either. And they live in a small town. So it must be something with the small towns and we just leave doors unlocked. We don't need them. We don't need keys. Yeah. It's weird now because everybody (laughs) in Nashville is like, oh, I got robbed. I got robbed or my car got robbed. And I'm like, and growing up, I mean, we never, we never had anything, you know, praise the Lord. We never had anything happen, but I never locked a car and never locked a door in my life. Now you do. Yeah. Now I have to every night, lock my car every day. Everything like that now. You talked about when you were in college, you played soccer, you had an injury, got into guitar, and music starts taking over. You attended Auburn University at Montgomery and obtained a master's in kinesiology and biomechanics. What was the career path for you thinking before music took over? So long story short, like I played soccer my whole life. And like any kid, man, I wanted to go play pro ball. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going to Faulkner University on scholarship for soccer. I played there for three years. Uh, My second year, I got hurt and tore my hip flexor in half. And so that was kind of it for it. Tried to go back and it just didn't work. So then I transferred to 
Aubrey Montgomery, did my undergrad in kinesiology. And I was playing music, and that was kind of the goal. But I was kind of like, hey, I need to make sure I have a backup plan. So at that time, I was looking at being a physical therapist and stuff like that. And then when I graduated, I was either going to make the move for music, and my professors offered me a spot to be a graduate assistant. So I would teach undergrad classes and get my master's. So it was kind of a great thing just because it's a lot cheaper to get your master's that way. So I did it and did that and it took about a year and a half or so to get your master's degree. Um, so I just stayed in college and kept playing around Alabama. And then in my mind, I was like, well, as soon as I graduate my master's, I'm going to move to Tennessee and I'll make bank with my master's <laughs> degree. And it did not happen that way at all, but that was the plan. Um, and so I don't even use my degree at all now. And then I moved to, as soon as I graduated, I ended up moving to Tennessee probably about within six months. So the degree was the backup. Music's always been the passion of what you've wanted to do. Yeah, exactly. It was, just a, it was a backup, and it was to me, it was a thing that I was trying just to get better at music and hoping that when I moved to Tennessee, I could be as good as I can be, which you never will be. Everybody here is so good. Um, and then I was thinking, you know, I have to have a way to fund it. You know, right. I didn't want to have to – I bartended throughout college, that's how I paid for most of college. And I didn't want to continue bartending and stuff like that to pay for music. I was hoping I could get something in my field to fund it. What was your first performance in front of a crowd? Where was that and when? My first performance. So funny enough, my first performance, I was, I was, so I was supposed to sing. I was in this, well, I guess my first performance. Okay. I was a little bitty kid and I was probably like six and I was a little drummer boy. It was always these Christmas plays. Mm -hmm. And then by about the time I was 10, I was supposed to have a singing solo and then the teacher told me that I wasn't good enough at singing. So they cut my solo <laughs> part and I did the whole acting part because I was good enough at acting. So I acted and then somebody came on and sang my song as me. <laughs> and I stood in the back. You, you haven't like called that teacher back and said, yeah, what about now? No, <laughs> maybe, maybe one day, maybe one day she'll hear something and go, Oh, okay. <laughs> July 6, 2018, you performed on WSFA 12 News for Alabama Live. What was that like performing in Alabama and on television for you? It was awesome. It was really a, an awesome experience. Um, that's kind of, that's a station that you kind of see all the time. You know, growing up there, you're familiar with it. So it was really cool to be on there. I'd seen other musicians come through and play there. So it was just really awesome to be involved there. Um, and then funny enough, my wife, she was my girlfriend at the time. She was doing all my booking and calling people, acting like she was my manager and everything like that. And that's, she's the one that actually got me on there. Um, and so it was really fun, man. That's an awesome, anytime you get to play live, anytime you get to play where it's on radio televised and you can reach a lot of people, man, it's an awesome thing, especially if it's in your hometown as well. Listeners, go to the show notes. I'm going to put a link to Jesse's music. If you haven't checked it out, you need to. I'm telling you, this guy is on the rise. His music is really good. 2018, you released I'm Going Out. Who wrote it? How did it come about? And So that song was my first attempt at putting out music. Um, I wrote it all myself, did the music, and contacted. I didn't know what I was doing. So I contacted people in Nashville. <laughs> found a recording studio, came up here, didn't have any idea what I was doing. And they were naming out the charts and all this kind of stuff. And the band was insane that played on it because the music sounds great. And then I sang the song and I mean, I've, I've, I'm not a big fan of that song. I've left it up just because it was my first thing I ever did and like went all in for country music. Um, but now as you grow in songwriting and stuff like that, you always look back at those songs and you're like, man, this should have been different. Um, but I went up there and I recorded three songs, put that one out. And I think I got like 20 streams in the first week. And so I never put the other two songs out. I was just like, well, I need to get better songs. <laughs> it's not a bad song. I mean, I know you probably beat it up because that's what we do. And with our own creations, we beat them up as yep. we progress, but it's not a bad song at all. I mean, I, I think my listeners will enjoy it. I think you're hard on it because of what you're doing now. And compared to that, to what your new single is, yes, there's a difference, but that's, that's not a bad song. Well, thank you. In 2018, another thing you did was when you were part of Rock the Park at Riverwalk Amphitheater in Montgomery, Alabama, did that 
do anything for your career? Did that make you feel like you were one of somebody or wanted to do more with it? Uh, it did. I mean, it was an awesome opportunity. Again, we got to play a stage, the amphitheater. Like I had gone to shows there. I think I saw one Republic play there. Like I saw people that I loved in music play there. So just to play on the stage was awesome. Um, and that was one of the first shows that I had done where I had like a drummer and stuff like that. And it was just, I think it was just the Cajon player. My, one of my buddies that was in my wedding played that for me. And so that was just awesome. You know, it was another one of those stepping stones to play in front, in front of more people. When you first started playing shows, man, I would play shows to five people. So I remember one time I played a show and there was nobody. Did you play? I played that. And I mean, there wasn't even a bartender. I went to this bar to play and they said, oh yeah, you're setting up out front. So I set up out front. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't playing nobody. So I just pointed my speaker towards the road and put it as high as I could get it and just started playing. I love that story. That is fantastic. You got to use that when you, you know, take the stage one time in front of thousands and go, I went from playing to zero <laughs> to playing this. <laughs> <laughs> Between 2018 and 2020, when you released Natty Light, were you continuing to record and write music? You just didn't like what you had then? Yeah, I was continuing. I was recording, I mean, recording my own little home studio, trying to get better at that stuff constantly. And I was writing constantly. I was still in Alabama and there's not a lot of like co-writing that goes on in Alabama. So I was just writing by myself. And of course, when you write by yourself, you think everything you write is either amazing or terrible. Mm. Um, so I was kind of just trying to prep myself. So when I got to Tennessee, so I was trying to write, I don't know how many hundreds of song or songs I wrote. I just wrote as much as I could just to, when I got to Tennessee, I could do the best with it I could. But at that time I kind of knew like, Hey, it's not, it's good in my opinion, but I don't think it's good enough. Like I need to get better. So, and I wanted the next thing that I released after I'm going out to really be a step above. Um, so I wanted to just kind of wait until I thought that I was really kind of writing on the next level. And it'll, and I'll continue to probably look back at old songs and be like, Oh, I should have done this different, but you know, you just want to continually grow with it constantly. When did you know you had something with Natty light that you wrote with a couple buddies of yours? And I need the background on this beer. Why was it Natty light? So why it was Natty light was my wife, my father-in-law. That's what he loves. He loves Natty light. That's his beer choice. So we'll go anywhere and it's always a Natty Light. And most times places don't even sell Natty Light. <laughs> like you can only get it at like Walmart. And I think Applebee's has it on draft or something. <laughs> it used to be like Maybe that's PBR. But I was with my buddies and it was during COVID time. And so we, I didn't have a ton of people I knew in Nashville. It's like nobody wanted to write with you because it was COVID, of course. You know, so there was a couple of guys I had met before everything hit a guy named John Ashburn and Cody Kelly who were all great writers. Um, and so they came over and had this idea. I was like, man, let's write this stuff by some cheap beer. I had a couple of lines and we wrote it. Didn't think anything of it. We write a ton of songs. And then I was like, all right, man, let's put this on. I think it was Instagram, put it on Instagram, tag Natty light, did all that kind of stuff. And then they ended up reaching out like probably a week or two weeks after that. And just, one of their reps reached out, said they liked it. They want to do like a talk about maybe potentially doing an endorsement sponsorship deal. So we did that. It's kind of a little bit of a process. And then, you know, they were sending, it was like, they just send you free beer. They'd send you free merch. You'd have to post on their behalf and put that you're represented by them and kind of like a social media sponsorship, man. So when you get free beer and you're getting free stuff like that, like, that's a fun in COVID. Like I was like, this is a win. <laughs> and all, a, all of a sudden Natty light is not so bad anymore. Yeah, exactly. It starts <laughs> tasting better. <laughs> Listeners. We're going to hear a clip of the song. I remember when I got my fake ID, $10 bill burning holes in my jeans, my junior year. Never been so scared. The guy behind the counter said, you ain't full of me. Son, you weren't born in 93, but he smiled at me and gave me that beer anyways. That was my first Natty Light. One sip and we were flying high. Yeah, when you ain't got much, man, it's enough to get the job done and get you a buzz. You'll be feeling all right, feeling just fine. 
That is a catchy song, Jesse. I mean, I really like it. Is it a true story of going to a bar and the bartender doesn't buy the fake ID, or is that just a line? So that part is just a line. Okay. So, so that was just the line. I think it was a, it was more of a true story for one of my co-writers because um, I never had a fake ID growing up. I didn't have I didn't have my first taste of alcohol until I was probably twenty years old. Mm. <laughs> I was like a late one because I was playing college sports and my coach was on us like, don't get in any trouble. So all I did was play sports. Um, but then in the second verse, it talks about that blonde and that's my wife. Um, and that kind of where it correlates from how to her father-in-law where that's what his favorite drink is and stuff like that. Um, and that's the beauty, man, of writing songs is it's so fun because you get to tell stories and you get to put, you know, if you have three co-writers in a room, you got stories from three different people. Right. And then you're pulling that all together to make one story that's cohesive together. So it's cool because there's like bits and pieces that are like, that's their direct line representation of me. And then there's a direct representation of one of my buddy's lives. So it's real fun to do that. You get to pull all over the place. Now that you have the sponsorship with Natural Light Beer, how does that go with the free beer and now the father-in-law loving Natural Light? Is he in heaven? He was most. He was more excited when I told him about that than anything ever. Like he was so excited when I told him that. I don't think he believed me. But I think that was when it hit. Like that was when his thing hit. Like not when I got my master's degree, none of that. I think when I got a beer sponsorship, he was like, oh man, he's done something. (laughs) It's got to be something with fathers. I recently just released an interview I did with Carlos Mencia, who's a comedian. Uh And he did a Super Bowl commercial for Bud Light. And he talked about Bud Light found out it was his birthday. And they sent a Bud Light truck to the house and opened up the side panels and said, take whatever you want. And he said, I look back and my dad's got a tear in his eye. And I said, you all right? And he said, mijo, you made it. He's like, are you serious? He's like, I've been selling out arenas. I'm on TV, but this is it. It's the, it must be the beer. <laughs> I could buy you all this beer if I wanted to, but the fact that it is just free from Budweiser, we made it. Correct. Make a difference with free as a tea. Did you know one in five Americans will experience a mental health challenge every year? Free as a tea is giving the gift of good. For every t-shirt purchased, $5 will be donated to the Mental Health Coalition to support mental health resources for the millions of people who need them. Plus, for every purchase, one shirt is donated to someone in need. Free your mind and shop with a cause. Buy one, give one for $45 and learn more about us and our mission at freeasatea.com or click the link in the show notes. Make a difference, one tea at a time. Happy tea time. Moving up to 2022. The song used to. How did that song come about? Who wrote it? So that was me, my buddy John. John has written all three of my last singles with me. He's one of my best friends in Tennessee. He's a great artist, a great writer. You should check him out if you ever have time. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was me, him, and the guy named Cole Miracle, who's another great writer. And that was kind of a song that I had this idea of, again, that we wrote it in my studio at my house, brought the guys in. It was this idea kind of taking what it would be if my relationship with my wife didn't go to where it was. Cause like before we got married, we did have some, we broke up before we got engaged. So there was a time where we were broken up for just a little while and it was kind of pulling back. Some of that song stuff had come from them, some of the ideas and I was able to go back in and get some of that stuff and just kind of take yourself to a place of what that would have been like to try and make it more emotional in that standpoint. Funny enough, we we wrote it and then we rewrote that song probably five times. We kept on rewriting it. And then I was going into the studio and I was I called Cole and I was like, hey, man, I go to the studio tomorrow, but it's still not there. And so we got together that night before and literally rewrote part of the song again. It's one of those songs where for me, when I heard it, I'm like, OK, I like it. But the more I listen to it, the more I like it. It's it kind of <laughs> it kind of grows on you. And I want the listeners to hear a clip. Here we go. you 
What's your wife think of the lyrics to that song? So she likes the song, but you know, funny enough, when like you write songs and you're married, you know, they're always going to ask you if it's about them, Mm -hmm. you know, so you have to kind of (laughs) like, you got to make sure you have a love song coming. And that's why the next song that came out was a love song. Um, because I had written, (laughs) I'm going out was not a love song. The beer drinking one was definitely not a love song. And then I went to a breakup song. So I was like, I'm a married guy. I need to have a love song come out. And that's where you come from, the inspiration for you. Yep, exactly. How long did it take you to put that song together? So that song is probably the longest song to put together because I started writing that song when me and my wife were dating. So that song was probably starting to be written probably five years ago, back Mm. to when I was like, I didn't release any music and I was just writing. I had written it and I'd written an entire song called you. And it was, it wasn't there yet. And so I had never put it out. I was like, man, it's just not there yet. It's missing something, but it has some really good stuff to it. So then eventually like me, John and Cole, who wrote used to like, we write a ton together. We write good together. I was like, guys, I have this song that I want to rework. And so we took it in and just reworked it from top to bottom has a lot of the same, like, lines and the main idea is there um we did reform a lot of that song and that's where that came from um and so man it was it came together really fast once we went back in and rewrote it but that song was probably a five year in the making song what does this song mean to you personally um personally it's just it's something i'm proud of you know to to put something that worked so long ago on and then to up my talents and my writing ability so I could rewrite and have some, some great writers come in and help me with it. And then as well, just a song that kind of represents me and my relationship with my wife, you know, um, you know, you're always growing up when you're getting, you know, 19, 20 and stuff like that. And you you don't know who you're going to end up marrying. And that's always kind of the, the thing in life. And you're kind of trying to prep yourself for that. And my dad always growing up was like, you know, you're not prepping yourself for who you date and prepping yourself for who you marry one day. And so a lot of your decisions in life, that's where it's going to accumulate to or just who you end up with one day. So I tried to just keep that in the back of my head, live in life and know that one day I'm going to be married and everything I did leading up to that is either going to help it, lead me to that person or not. Um, so that's kind of where that song came from. Let's hear a clip. You'd buy your love. What kind of feedback response are you getting from this single? That's been my best single to date so far. Um, So I've just tried to grow with every single song that I put out. and I have successfully done that. Um, And my wife loved that song. That was like, that's her favorite song, of course. And then just relationship with people wise, you know, playing it at shows, people just respond to it. People love it. Um, People through you getting tags on social media or, people making Instagram videos to it or TikTok videos or something along those lines. And then it's the one that's got on the most playlists and everything like that. So it's, it's done the best for me. Um, And we're hoping we can just continue that success on with the next song and make it even bigger and better. It could be the song that makes Jesse Cofty a household name. Hopefully (laughs) that's the goal. I understand. That's the goal. What is it like for you to use in from listening to you talk your own life experiences to connect your music and then connect that with your fans? Um, I think it's, it's unique because you get to, everybody has a unique story in life, you know, and everybody's unique story people can relate to, you know, everybody will be like, they don't have a story to tell. Well, we've all let, like, we can all connect with one another in some areas. So it's kind of like be as true as you can in some of your songs and hopefully it's going to connect. Um, and sometimes, like I said before, you get your co-writers in there and it's awesome because you get to have those people come in and connect with you. Um, and you get to pull from their life stories and kind of make one big thing. And I think it's awesome too. The coolest thing is when you play songs and either people sing the words back to you, like that happened 
couple of, man, it's been a couple of weeks or so. And, and that's just an awesome feeling, you know, when you can see people singing the song to you or you get somebody to cry or anything like that. Like, that's just the best thing. Or even when you play Natty Light, if you can make a smile come somebody's face or make them laugh in a part or something like that, you know, you're doing your, your job as a songwriter is just really to make people kind of forget everything else for about three and a half minutes and just kind of get lost. You've put them underneath your own label of Treehouse Records. When did you start the label? That label was kind of because when I was when I was releasing my songs, I think so. I'm with uh, my PRO is ASCAP, which is just your affiliated who you write under. Um, it's not like you're signed to them or anything like that. And so, like, you can do your part when you do your publishing that you can own your own publishing through a record, so you can create your own record. So I created Treehouse Records, and that was kind of the name came from my dad. My dad owned a tree business called CNC Tree Service. And then my dad passed away probably six years ago now. Um, and so we had a big tree house he built for us and stuff like that. So that was kind of just in honor of him. And just so that my music is all under one category. You know, if something ever mm-hmm. takes off, I'm sure that I won't be able to put anything out under that anymore. Um, but I thought it was just a cool thing to be able to do for right now. That'd be a good problem to have if you can't put it underneath there anymore. Yeah, that's, that's a good problem to have on that. <laughs> What's your favorite song to cover? To cover? I tell you, lately, well, so lately my favorite song to cover, just if I'm playing out, I like that By Dirt song, just putting that out and singing it. But, like, favorite song to cover in, like, a full band is got to be, like, Kryptonite or mm. something just where you can get the whole band involved. Like, we had a show here on in Nashville a couple of weeks ago. And that was one we threw a cover in there and it was kryptonite. And that's a fun song to play just because my guitarist gets to have some fun. And it's, it's fun when you get to put a rock song in there every now and then. You just segued right where I was going to go is how can listeners find out where you're playing next and that kind of stuff. Um, so you can just follow me on Instagram. If you want, just Jesse Cofty. I have my TikTok that has Jesse Cofty music. Most of my shows are spon- are put on Instagram. Um, whenever I'm playing, it'll be on stories. It'll be on um, the main page. You'll be able to find the stuff there. Um, and then I haven't been playing as much lately. It's kind of down down a little bit with the holiday season coming up. And then we're revamping for next year. I know we're going in the studio in January. We've got, I know we have about four songs that are coming out year- next year. And I don't know the dates on when each song will release. Um, but I know we're going in in January to cut the next song and then get ready on releasing for the next year. Listeners, I'll put a link in the show notes to Jesse's TikTok and his Instagram, and you can follow him there and then watch for releases on the new songs and where you might be playing. If you had a choice, who would you, of anybody out there, like to open up for? Realistically or anybody in the world? Let's do both. Let's do anybody in the world first. Okay, anybody in the world, it's got to be George Strait. Nice. But, that's, but then we go to realistically. <laughs> well, you then you can tell them that you know that it's not really, you know, armadillo by morning. <laughs> <laughs> I've grown up since then. <laughs> that's right. So who do you think realistically is then? Man, like right now in, in music, one of my favorite writers and artists is Hardy. That's a guy that I really, I love Hardy. I love his music. I love his style. Um I grew up in like listening to that warp tour kind of punk rock stuff and Hardy pulls from a lot of that kind of stuff with his heavier stuff he's bringing out. So I love Hardy's music. He'd be a guy I would love to just meet, but just to, if I could open up for Hardy, that would have been insane kind of thing. Outside of music living in Nashville, what else does Jesse Cofty do? Hang out with my wife and go to the gym. And, that, and that's, that's about my life. I work, so I work in finance throughout the day as well, just to help support music stuff. And then I think from being a college athlete, I've always had to stay busy. I can't sit still. Um, so I got into CrossFit out of college, got hurt doing that as well. And then now I just work out as much as I can. And we just got a puppy a month ago. So that's kept me pretty busy as well. I thought maybe being in Nashville, you might be an outdoorsman getting out hiking, hunting and doing that kind of stuff. I, well, that's what kills me out here is I have nowhere to hunt. So I'm taking off. I'm going home for like 10 days for Christmas so I can hunt. There so you go. Hunt and, and stuff like that. But out here, I don't have any land and I don't have, I don't have any buddies that are up there enough yet where they have hunting land. I can just go use. <laughs> That's the next stage in life when That's, I can get that. Yeah. So I, have, when I have a friend that tells me he's got a couple hundred acres. Right. Or you have your own couple hundred acres. 
Exactly. <laughs> That's the next tier above that one. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, thanks so much for taking time coming on the show, talking about what you've done in your life and career. I wish you nothing but success. I'm a fan. I love your music. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me too, Tommy. You are more than welcome. Listeners, make sure you go to the show notes to click on Jesse's stuff to listen to his music. Follow him on social media. There's also a link there to buy what they call Tommy a glass of vino. I'll have a glass of wine on you. Shout your name out on the show. Also, remember... This is the Christmas show. So after the music, stay tuned for your holiday tunes. That'll do it for this edition of Before the Lights podcast. I'm Tommy Canale. And until next time, everybody, I salute a chin chin.